Why do giraffes have such long necks? Is it just to eat the canopy where no other animal can? Is it just for sex? The precise nature of the evolution of the giraffe neck has been the focus of intensive research for many decades. All the way back to the time of Darwin and Lamarck, the evolutionary mechanism for the necky boys has been debated. A newly described giraffe relative from Miocene China sheds new light on not just an extraordinary mechanism hitherto undreamt of in giraffoids, but also on the evolutionary mechanism for modern giraffes' long necks. Meet the Bash Giraffe, Discocaryx. The Jungar Basin is one of the largest sedimentary basins in northwest China. Basin being a big-ass depression in the earth, usually filled up with sediment that is hardened into layers of rock. This basin is absolutely mahusive and expansive, spanning from the Precambrian all the way to modern Holocene terrestrial sediments and regional mud volcanoes and evaporites. There are a bunch of missing holes punched into this stratigraphic column, but today we'll zero in on a known layer which holds a new secret to the evolution of the giraffe. This layer being the Halamagai Formation. One of the best localities from the Halamagai Formation, the Tyre Isabahe locality, was the site where a huge team of researchers from the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing discovered a ton of different animals from about 17 million years ago in the 1990s. All of the stuff that was found and that continues to be found there were taken back to the museum and worked on. 1158 specimens take a lot of time and people to prepare and describe, and a few specimens from this collection were finally fully described in the last few years and were just published by another huge team of researchers led by Dr. Shi Chi Wang. Not much of the whole skeleton was found, but fragments from different individuals and different parts of the front part of the skeleton were found, including the holotype. IVPP V26602, a brain case and the first handful of neck vertebrae. They also found about 20 other bits, including another adult brain case, a juvenile brain case, some vertebrae, and isolated sphenoid, and 12 fragments belonging to the skull, teeth, and jaws. The holotype, the brain case, and series of neck vertebrae were found all the way back in 1996 by J. Meng, while the paratype, V26604, was found by W.Y. Wu in 1997. Unfortunately, that is not enough for most folks to tell what the hell the thing is, but mammals are different than dinosaurs when it comes to their bones. Thanks to having more direct modern analogs, mammal workers can more easily distinguish genera, species, and sometimes even subspecies by bone alone. Unlike dinosaurs, teeth can even be used to help distinguish genera and species from already known ones. They can contain what are called autopomorphies. These are characteristics unique to a given taxon and shared by no others. With that in mind, what the hell was this critter? And what the hell did it look like? The brain case happened to preserve the hardest part of the skull and the part that makes it immediately stand out. This thing had a flat disc-like chunk of hardened, roughened bone atop the skull roof. It did not seem to project much farther than the top of the skull, so it was a singular, rounded, disc-like platform right at the back of the head. It was thanks to this disc-like horn on its head that it got the name Discocaryx shishui. Disco is Latin for round plate and carex for horn. The species name shishu comes from a one-horned giraffe of the same name from Chinese legends. The disc-like platform is seen most clearly in the skull belonging to the juvenile individual, which may mean they had this platform early on in their development. The finely roughened surface of the platform, a texture simply referred to as rugose, suggests that there would have been a bigger covering of keratin over the bone, latching onto and growing from the roughened bone. This keratinous stuff would have grown from within the skin, with old layers being pushed up and out by new layers as they formed. 
the biggest and oldest individuals would have had the biggest and widest platforms. So, I'm not the only one here thinking this looks mighty familiar, and not just familiar to one other animal, right? This thing is extremely reminiscent of the battering ram skulls of the Pachycephalosaurian dinosaurs, the Tapinocephalian synapsids, muskox, bighorn sheep, other modern and extinct bovids, and oddly a few fish and some amphibians. It's a thing that pops up a lot, and very rarely in carnivores. What was it doing with this battering skull? Well, we can assume it used it to ram things, like many have assumed of pachycephalosaurs and dinocephalians, but you need to conduct tests to figure out how well the bones would fare in such a scenario. Such tests have been done with pachycephalosaurs and dinocephalians and have shown they physically could have used their heads in head-to-head -head fights as assumed. Flank butting is also not out of the question and would have reduced some brain injuries. No matter how thick your head is, you're still gonna get some sort of brain trauma. Thicker heads just dampen that trauma. In the case of Discocaryx, the team established the thickness of the skull and helmet at about 50 millimeters or 3 inches at least, but there is the possibility of a much thicker skull. Now, Pachycephalosaurus had a thicker skull at 9 inches 100 millimeters thick, but was a tad larger, and also a dinosaur, so the thickness here in Discocaryx is similarly thick proportionally. The oddly dummy thick skull is not the only adaptations Discocaryx had for headbutting. Let's take a look at those neck bones. Put simply, the Chinese mammal had cinder blocks for neck bones. The vertebrae themselves are extremely large, chunky, reinforced, and tightly articulated. The articulations between the vertebrae are extremely enlarged. All of this is stuff that strongly suggests a shock-absorbing adaptation throughout the neck and possibly the trunk of the body too. Now, how do you push it further? How do you quantify how strong the head and neck of this beast was when it was alive? You do some math, use some computers, and digitally model what happens to the bones when they hit things. And don't forget to compare it with a bunch of other known headbutters. The team conducted a few tests. One of those tests is called a finite element analysis using the finite element method. On a technical side, this method is a popular method for numerically solving differential equations, which arise in engineering and mathematical modeling. Also, these tests are usually used in the context of structural analysis, heat transfer, fluid flow, mass transport, and electromagnetic potential, but can be used in the structural analysis of living things. In the case of living things, that usually means bone rather than flesh and bone. When it comes to very simple geometrically shaped objects like 4x4s, bits of metal, light beams, etc., you can mathematically calculate their strength or how they might change over time given a set of parameters. When it comes to extremely complex materials like bones or fluids, you need a way to calculate these equations without literally calculating an equation by hand for every single geometric shape. That would be impossible for the human mind or just take too damn long. It's hard for me to wrap my head around as I have never done an analysis like this. Never had anyone teach me, nor have any immediate need to learn every aspect of it. But to horrifically simplify to get to the cool parts, the finite element method divides a given object into smaller elements that are connected together by nodes to create a mesh. This is a similar mesh to what is used and seen when creating and animating a 3D model in software like Blender. By simplifying it in this way, the equilibrium requirement and all the math stuff can be satisfied only over a finite amount of discrete or simple elements. You don't have to do it over the whole object all at once. To learn more about this method and software, I recommend watching the Efficient Engineers video, Understanding the Finite Element Method. I'll most likely end up learning a lot more about this as my career in paleontology progresses, but for now, I'm scurred and we need to see this applied to the busty bones of our new dome-headed friend.
They had two tests for two different models of the head and neck vertebrae. One test, which they called the Thick Cervical Model, used 3D scans of the skull and neck unchanged. The second test, which they called the Attenuated Cervical Model, removed the accessory head and neck articulations from the digital geometry. See, here, they removed these chunks from the bottom of the head and neck bones, as they may not play as big a role in shock absorption as the rest of the bone. Removing them may allow for a more specific interpretation. These tests show that the highly specialized head and neck bones of Discocaryx were definitely related to some intense headbutting action. To make sure they covered their bases, the team also modeled the bones of living headbutters, namely the muskox, argali, and baral. They found that this cocarix could take higher stresses to its bones and its brain jiggle around in its skull less than all the modern mammals it was tested against. Well, it was relatively equivalent in how good of a headbutter it was to the muskox, so there was that at least. Furthermore, the type of adaptation seen in the neck bones of Discocaryx have not been observed in any other headbutting animal, living or extinct. Thus, for all intents and purposes, our Discocaryx friend is the most optimized skull bashing animal ever known. To add insult to injury, the skulls of the juvenile showed evidence of osteomyelitis, or inflammation and swelling of bone, indicating that even young individuals were clashing clankers. Besides the fact about its headbutting behaviors and traps for days, what kind of animal was Discocaryx? What did it look like, and how did it live? In order to get a better understanding of its biology, we need to understand what the hell it is. I've made several allusions to it being a giraffe, but the real identity is a little tricky. The original paper describing the remains say that the characteristics of the bones supports identification of Discocaryx as a member of the huge Giraffoidea clade. Contrary to what the very few remaining giraffoids, giraffes, okapis, and pronghorns might have us believe, giraffe cousins and ancestors were super common all over the world, except South America and the usual islands and island continents. They also varied dramatically in size, proportions, ecology, and head ornaments. The teeth of Discocaryx were shown by the researchers to resemble most closely those of the leaf-antlered giraffoid Prolibitherium. Unfortunately, one of the characteristics that give away a giraffoid identity the most, the lower canines, were missing from Discocaryx, so a stronger identity could not be reached just from observing, measuring, and describing the morphology of the bones alone. When the team did a full phylogenetic analysis, they found that this cocarex was most closely related to Cytomotherium, a bovid with a similar skull platform that grew out of the skull in a similar way. Wait a minute, didn't they say Discocaryx was a giraffoid? Well, Cytomotherium's skull platform is not seen in any other bovids and is what sets it apart. So the team is hypothesizing that it really wasn't a bovid and that both Cytomotherium and Discocaryx are giraffoids forming their own group, the Discocaricinae. With that said, they also support that leafhead, Prolibitherium, as the sister group to this disc-headed, headbutting group of short-necked weirdos. Despite these hypotheses, some other researchers have cautioned skepticism in regard to how Cytomotherium plays into this. Dr. Darren Nash posited that at least some experts are saying that alleged new headbutting giraffe Discocaryx is not a giraffe nor even close, but a bovid related to Cytomotherium. That would make more sense, hmm. The two being related may make sense if it turns out that Cytomotherium is not really a bovid, but instead a giraffoid. It turns out that the fossil record and research history of Cytomotherium is a little complicated. Some other researchers chimed into Dr. Darinesh's comments. Dr. Avait M. Jukar pointed out that the teeth assigned to Discocaryx was very clearly more similar to giraffes than to bovids. There are two named species of Cytomotherium, Hedonai and Brevirostrum. The material for the first species, Hedonai, was rather fragmented and without teeth preserved. The majority is the hard skull cap, as in Discocaryx. 
This makes it more difficult to slam the hammer down on the bovid classification for the remains of this species. But the newer species, Brevirostrum, has better fossils assigned to it. These include much more of the face and head with teeth too. These remains are much more unmistakably bovid, but they also come from a female individual. Together, this may mean the fossils belonging to Cytomotherium hedonii belong to a giraffoid, and the fossils of Cytomotherium brevirostrum belong to a bovid. Great! Two different animals. Dr. Bastian Menekart, one of the authors on the Discocaryx paper, again noted the thing about the Discocaryx teeth being definitively giraffoid in shape but also noted the inner ear was preserved with the skull and that it too was very giraffoid in shape. He also noted that the platform structures on the skull of the original Cytomotherium skull material were more like ossicones than the bony horn cores of bovids. Tricky stuff. But all of this will help to better get an idea of what the rest of the animal looked like. We don't absolutely need the rest of the skeleton to have a good working hypothesis. So, what did it look like? If we are to fill in the gaps of the head and neck region with the same type of bones that fill out these regions in its prolibitheriid and giraffoid relatives, then it may have looked something like this. The front of the skull here is reconstructed on giraffoids with a longer snoot than bovids are known for. The flat skull platform has been widely reconstructed as the base from which a hemisphere battering ram is attached, though other shapes are possible, like this flat top. The neck bones would not have continued much past the neck bones that are known. These guys were short-necked giraffoids, kinda goes along with the ramming and neck reinforcements. Though its proportions may have been unique, it has been reconstructed by most with a moderate body plan, like a deer or antelope. Heavier set limbs and trunk, like in horses or muskox, may have been needed to power such a heavy weapon. What was it eating? Well, thanks to the preservation of its teeth, the team were able to get a general idea of what kind of niche Discocaryx occupied. They figured, through the composition and number of carbon and oxygen isotopes in its enamel, that it was an open land grazer with multiple sources of water intake or seasonality in its habitat. They found a part of their sample range that did not overlap with the isotope range of all other known early to mid Miocene fossil communities of northern China. This means that Discocaryx was also utilizing a resource no other animal around was utilizing. What that was is a mystery for now, but it possibly points to why it evolved its bizarre features. Well, it explains one possible reason anyway. Most modern headbutters tend to occupy harsh climates with poor food availability. Bighorn sheep and most other big horny sheep live high up in the mountains, musk oxen live in the tundra, and so on. One possible explanation as to why Pachycephalosaurus remains are so rare in the fossil record is that they too may have been high elevation enjoyers. Something about living like that just makes you ornery and want to fight each other. Or more realistically, perhaps only using visual cues for selecting a mate while also living high up in the mountains isn't great. Mashing your brains together is much more intimate and easier to manage while being in harsh climates. Plus, you have to be short, stout, and hefty to live in these sorts of harsh environments, and bashing skulls and stockiness go hand in hand. The research team therefore note it's quite possible Discocaryx occupied a marginal niche, traveling between different habitats but preferring to stay away from other animals up in higher elevation areas with harsher climates. What else was living with these beasts? What was the region like? Discocaryx comes from the Halamagai Formation, which dates to the early to mid Miocene Epoch, about 16.9 or 17 million years ago. This layer of rock is composed of several greenish, upwardly fining fluvial sediments. Fluvial just means freshwater deposits. The conditions preserved in this layer and the layer above it suggest the region exhibited quite a humid climate. This rock layer has yielded abundant, large mammalian fossils from all sorts of groups. You got your elephants, Platybelodon and Gomphotherium. You got your predators, bear dogs like Gobi Scion cats like Orion Smilus, and red pandas like Alopeca Cyan. 
Then you have your other artiodactyls, Climacoceratids, Okapi-like giraffids, Triceromerix, the bovid Eotragus, the musk deer Micromerix, and the anthracotheriid Elomerix, and Ligeromerix, and the pig Cubanochorus. Then you've got your Parisodactyls, the rhino Diaceratherium, and the horse Anchitherium, your primates in the form of Pliopithecus, and your rodents like the beaver Steniofiber. One last bit of insight that Discocarix can provide is in the evolution of the giraffe neck. But Edge, you ask, if Discocarix is so distantly related to the giraffes of today as to only belong in its own group along with the other non-giraffe giraffoids, then how could it tell us about the evolution of the giraffe? Glad you asked, random commenter. With this new type of giraffoid headgear, there is now a huge diversity in headgear and the body adaptations to support them. Why did this divergence happen? The one in Discocarix may have occurred due to ecological factors as it appeared during the mid-Miocene climate optimum, a period of worldwide warming. This period of climate change opened up several new local niches in Asia after a long period of aridity. This may be why this formation has so many different ruminant animals. Many have hypothesized that giraffes evolved such long necks over time as the group took advantage of foliage that no other animals could reach. The discovery of Discocarix provides evidence for a sort of flip of this hypothesis. Maybe the ecology was not the primary factor, and instead sexual selection was the jumpstart to the long necks of modern giraffes. Here we see a short-necked giraffe among many other short-necked giraffes and giraffe relatives. All had different headgear and were using them all differently. If the necks evolved solely for reaching into the canopy, then surely they would be selected for above any short-necked forms. Instead, the long necks of modern giraffes likely originate in a change of environment and change in sexually selected behaviors. In the little Discocarix, they were bashing their brains together for sex. For the pronghorns and relatives, they used their horns for head-on battles and visual display. For things like Prolimitherium, well, uh, who knows with those weirdos. Eventually, one group diverged from the others in necking each other with less deadly ossicones and over time, we're left with modern giraffes. So there we have it. A brand new, bizarre giraffoid to add to the roster, a wholly new reproductive strategy to add to the bucket list, and another to add to the list of things that keep getting recycled. Funny thing here is that it wasn't the dinos that did it first. Mammal precursor cousins did it first, dinos copied, and mammals brought the goldie oldie back. Can you think up some more bizarre strategies like this that we have only found in one or two groups that could have popped up again in completely different groups? There's a lot of room there for speculative biology. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubbinger, Biotiverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.